arguably is the most significant component of the SEFT power, education. Because be it tourism, culinary skill, performing arts, everybody, every art form has a component of education attached to it. And it was the educational prowess of India, actually, that brought thousands of scholars from far and wide to renowned institutions like Takshila and Nalanda. And to chair this session on education, we could have had nobody better than uh, Professor Sunaina Singh, who is the Vice Chancellor of Nalanda University and a member board of trustee India Foundation, as well as a member of the organizing committee of this particular conference. Uh, may I now request uh, Professor Sunaina Singh to kindly come onto the dais, please. I'll now request uh, Dr. Tatiana Shomyan, head Center for Indian Studies, Institute for Oriental Studies, Russian Academy of Sciences, who has published more than 200 publications in Russia, India, USA, Great Britain, etc., including a very well-known book, The Image of Russia and India, Past and Present, which was published in Moscow in 2011 in Russian. And Russia seeks to revive the Premakov tri Triangle with India and China in the Global Dialogue Review. May I request Dr. Tatiana to kindly take her place on the dais. Our next speaker is Professor Shonak Rishi Das. He is the founder director of the Oxford Center of Hindu Studies, a lecturer, a broadcaster, and a Hindu chaplain to Oxford University. Rishi Das has taken a leading role in the systemic development of Hindu studies as an academic subject. He founded Europe's first theology college in Belgium. He was also appointed by the Government of India to sit on the International Advisory Council of the Auroville Foundation. I now request uh, Professor Shonak Ravshidash to kindly take his seat. Our next speaker, you are well familiar with this, uh, Professor Subhash Kak, who is the Regents Professor of the Electrical and Computer Engineering at Oklahoma State University and a Vedic scholar. His research has spanned the fields of information theory, cryptography, neural networks, and quantum information. He has also worked on archaeoastronomy and history of science and on art. He coined the term quantum neural computing, which is a theory of consciousness that is partly classical and partly quantum. His books include Mind and Self and The Nature of Physical Reality. He was there with Sadhguru in the inaugural session. I request you to kindly take your place. Our next speaker is Sri Ramdas Lam, Professor Ramdas Lam, who is a religious professor at the University of Hawaii, where he has been teaching for 30 years. Prior to entering higher education, he was a sadhu in the Ramananda Sampradaya for nearly 10 years. During that time, he had resided mostly in northern and central India. Ramdas Lam's uh, scholarly research has focused on low caste religious movements in central India, on Hindu asceticism and monasticism, and on the traditional practices of yoga. I'll now request Professor Lam to kindly take his seat. And our final speaker for the day uh, of this session is uh, Mr. Com Carpentia de Godo, uh, who is currently the convener of the editorial board of the World Affairs Journal, a quarterly publication dedicated to international issues, sponsored by the Kapoor Surya Foundation, uh, New Delhi. He is also a consultant to Infos India Industries Limited, a company founded and chaired. Well, namaskar and good morning to all of you. Uh, we have five eminent speakers uh, this morning, and I think we have about uh, 12 minutes. I've, I thought 15, but I was told 10, so I thought probably we'll settle at 12, uh, so that we have enough time for uh, Q&A. Uh, vidya dadati vinayam, vinayat yati praptitam. You know, we, I think Indian soft power is intrinsically embedded in our education system and in our character building. Vivekananda ji spoke uh, uh, about man-making education, and I think our education system, right from the inception, uh, I'm talking about more than five millennia ago, when our, from when our spiritual and literary traditions have been coming down through generations. Uh, it's the longest ever spiritual and literary tradition ever in any uh, country. I think this is something that we need to celebrate as well. Uh, while today, uh, we have the top tech leaders, uh, 
in, in the, the top three companies being led by Indians. Uh, I think it's because of the soft power that's embedded in them uh, uh, from India that they're able to lead these uh, tech giants in the world. So Indian education system, while it has transited over the years, I think we must acknowledge that there is something in Indian education system that has been able to retain and sustain the ancient uh, um, knowledge traditions, uh, which largely, paradoxically, seem to be missing from uh, the education system in India. If you look at the university systems, we don't have the Indian knowledge traditions being taught there. We don't have a history of Indian knowledge traditions. While I sit in Nalanda, I wonder whether, uh, you know, India has done justice to our own um, educational leaders, our own gurus. Uh, we've been hailed as Vishwa gurus had we not had uh, uh, the colonial rule and been, uh, you know, enslaved for over 800 years, I think we would still continue to be Vishwagurus. So there, there's something to think about there and something for education leaders to posit on how we need to remodel education, how we need to reshape education system in India. Uh, with that opening uh, uh, comments, I think I will give the floor to you, ma'am, we begin with you. Yeah. What would you like to yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the organizer of this uh, conference uh, for the kind invitation and uh, I think that it is very big honor for me to participate in that and uh, I hope that this is only the uh, beginning of our conferences because uh, you know I, I think that many of us already participating in the many international and national conference and on many of them we discussed the some strategic problems, some military problems, conflicts, internal conflicts, uh, territorial conflict, and so on. And now for the first time, we'll have an opportunity to discuss the problems of soft power. And I am very grateful uh, for that. Um, I, uh, uh, as our chairman, chairperson represented me. I, uh, uh, I represented here the Institute of Oriental Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences. If you permit me, I would like to say a few words about that. Our institute uh, celebrates this year the 200th anniversary from its establishment. Our institute is one of the biggest academician institute, and we started the uh, Oriental <coughs> countries and our Center for Indian Studies, as I can represent here, uh, we uh, have a long tradition of contacts with the Indian universities, with the Jawaharlal Nehru University, with the Delhi University, with the Calcutta universities, uh, Jadapur University, and so. Um, uh, and I think that it was very big contribution to our joint uh, studies, uh, which we had a uh, long time. And uh, I also uh, teach in the Moscow University uh, in the Department of World Politics. And I unfortunately would like, uh, I don't want, but I should say that in past, in the past we have uh, many Indian students in our universities. It was in Soviet times. But unfortunately now, in our department, we don't have any of them. It is very pity, because uh, I, I understand that in post-Soviet period, the education has been commercialized, and now 
our education is also the, uh, the, it is not free. And, but I uh, can mention that we have a lot of students from China and uh, Republic of Korea. In my group, we have a lot of them. But unfortunately, we don't have Indian students. And I think that we should think about that at in future to change this position, this situation. Uh, I think that uh, to our countries, Russia and India, uh, over the centuries, uh, had interaction and contacts on various level of um, uh, uh, I should say that we did not have any contradictions or conflict situation in the relationship between our two countries. Uh, we, our relationship characterized by friendship and mutual understanding. And there has never been a need to use hard power and against each others. Representatives of the people of the two countries showed interest in discovering uh, each other. I would like only to mention, to remind, that in the middle of the 15th century, the very merchant, Afanasi Nikitin, one of the first European traveled to India, 30 years earlier than Vasco da Gama found the sea road to this country. His way lay from Tver, where he began his journey along the Volga to the Caspian Sea, and then in a, through three seas to India, on the west coast of which, in, Bombay, in the south of Bombay, he landed in 1471. Afanasi Nikitin left a detailed description of his trip and stay in India. His work, The Journey Beyond Three Seas, is published in several languages and uh, serves as an excellent source for studying the history of the establishment of Russian-Indian relations in life of the people of, Indian, uh, people of India. At the turn of the 18th, 19th century, the activity of talented musician from Yaroslavl, small town near Moscow, uh, Gerasim Lebedev, who lived in India for 12 years, contributed to the expansion of knowledge about India. He went there in 1785. He possessed some Indian languages and wrote the grammar of pure and mixed oriental dialects, which was published in London in 1801. He gave a detailed description of the beliefs, manners, and customs of the Indians founded in Calcutta in 1795, the first European theater. Indians treated Lebedev as one of the most remarkable personality in Indian culture of the 18th century. The scientist, bacteriologist, Dr. Hafkin, became widely known in India, to whom the world owes the discovery of the vaccines against cholera and plague. Hafkin lived about 20 years in India, where he went to fight the epidemics from Pasteur Institute uh, in Paris. Uh, the uh, essential aspect of soft power is related to the culture of the country its language, the level of scientific achievements, the attractiveness of its education and health care system, as well as its social economic model as a whole. The instrumental aspect of soft power includes specific institutions through which the essential aspect can be manifested. Various charitable foundations, governmental and non-governmental organizations, mass media, scientific and educational centers. Despite the, fact, despite the fact that the post-Soviet Russia came in a, enough difficult economic and social positions, Russia's soft power has remained its foundation. The popularity of Russian elite, elite theater, literature, academic music, recognized the merits of the USSI in the victory over Nazism, as well as a high level of authority of Russia in matters of space exploration. 
When discussing the problems of education in the modern world as one of the most important factors of soft power, I would like to emphasize that the concept of education goes far beyond the activities of traditional educational institutions, schools, institutes, universities, etc. High level of education can be provided by the high level of general culture in society and atmosphere of interaction and the mutual influence of other cultures, acquaintance with the world, the achievements of science and art. The most serious and profound lessons of wisdom, the possibility of expanding our knowledge in all areas of science and life, we can learn from the acquaintances with the works of outstanding scientists and thinkers, writers and poets, figures of various kinds of art. The knowledge that we can learn from their works and arguments, their contribution to the development of culture, science and education can serve as a unique source of knowledge for representative of many generations of citizens of India and Russia. Uh, the very important source for obtaining and expanding knowledge about India for Russian citizens was the personality, writings, and activities of Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi monuments stand in the square of his name in the area of Moscow State University. Uh, the success of Mr. Gandhi's policies associated with the deep in culture of the principle of nonviolence in Indian culture. The, the central concept in Mr. Gandhi's conception are Ahims and Satyagraha, and is the uh, avoidance of killing and go, doing harm of all living begins by action, words, and thoughts. Uh, I think that. Uh, you know that is really very uh, important for uh, for the soft power for our relationship and uh, for us the mr gandhi personal myth is associated with india's moral and spiritual authority according to gandhi nonviolent revolution does not provide for the seize of power but for the transformation of relationship with compel a peaceful transfer of power Mahatma Gandhi never got the Nobel Prize. Despite this omission, there is no doubt of the world importance of Gandhiji personality. When the film of uh, Richard Attenborough, Gandhi, won many Oscars in, 80, in 1983, posters for the film announced that Gandhi's triumph changes the world forever. Of particular interest is Gandhi's attitude to Russia, <clears throat> its culture and history. His statements about Russia and its citizens can be found in many works, books, articles, speech, speeches, letters, and interviews. Unlike Rabindranath Tagore and Jawaharlal Nehru, Mahatma Gandhi has never been in Russia. And all this information about the distant northern country was drawn from the English-speaking press, sometimes hostile, uh, or received from the few friends who visited Moscow and St. Petersburg <coughs> in different years. The name of Lev Tolstoy, philosopher, writer, as well as recognized, as is well recognized and esteemed by the people of Asia. Both this personality and his works keep a arousing interest of representatives for new generations. The literary activity of the Russian thinker ranges with classic and enduring values. His philosophic and religious views are similar to philosophic system and the religions of the East. This is particularly inherent for India, where Gandhi's system of philosophy, which became the banner of national liberation movement, form at the influence of idea of Lev Tolstoy. The works of Tolstoy has been well known in India as far back as the 80s of the 19th century. His books were translated into <coughs> European languages, including English, and were published just after being issued in Russia. Now, how soon they reached India, how they were delivered, and where were there all his works, now one can hardly ascertain. 
However, the reading public, to a large extent, was aware of his name and his views. Not only the impressions of his books translated into English were available. There were many publications in Indian newspapers and journals. Sometimes in newspapers, a specific citation or <coughs> passages from his book preceded the topic to be discussed in a certain uh, articles. His fiction uh, was less popular than the articles of ethical, philosophical, religious issue and his short stories for home and people. Being introduced to the ideas and statement left, uh, the, of Lev Tolstoy, some Indians were impelled to address their questions, request quiet to the Russian age. Before sending his first letter to Tolstoy, Gandhi published a series of articles about the Russo-Japanese War and the revolutionary events in <coughs> Russia in 1905-1907. Uh, he compared the situation in Tsarist Russia and British India and the position of broad segments of the population of both countries. He wrote, we are poor and the Russian people are poor. We bear our, the burden of taxes and have no voice in the decision of state affairs. The same thing happened in Russia. He came to this disappointing uh, conclusion. Uh, the appeal of Gandhi to Tolstoy seems logical. By the time the prophet of Jasna Palana, Jasna Palana is the uh, place resident of Lev Tolstoy about 100 kilometers from Moscow, he had great authority. Every day he received up to 30 <coughs> letters from correspondents from different countries seeking his help, support, or advice. Gandhi published in the newspaper Indian Opinion of 2nd September 1905 an article called Stoy. In the Western world, the article says, there is no such a talented and learned person such as a center as Count Tolstoy. In order to raise the morality of the people, he wrote several novels which can compare to only a few works of European writers. Uh, in his autobiography, Gandhi mentioned several works by Tolstoy. The Kingdom of God is Within Us, a brief exposition of the gospel, so what are we to do? And his other books, a strong impression on me, he wrote. Even in South Africa, he published several folk stories of Tolstoy translated into Gujarati. God sees the truth, but not soon say. Tale of Ivan the Fool and how much man needs land. In Gandhi's articles and letters, one can find information about Tolstoy's work such as life, confession, what art is, slavery of our times, and so on. But, interesting, but there is no <coughs> single mention uh, of novels War and Peace, Anna Karenina, and Resurrection. Gandhi probably never read these works at all. Uh, for Gandhi, Tolstoy was not first of all the writer, but a preacher of ideas of nonviolence. Correspondence between Gandhi and Tolstoy covers 1909 and uh, till 1910, a time when the young Gandhi just started the social political activities. But Tolstoy is, was that period on the way to the ending of journey of his life. Uh, uh, the first letter to Tolstoy Gandhi was sent on October the 1st, 1909 in, from London. He informed the great writer of the draconian laws in South Africa that infringe the rights of Indians. I felt that submission to law of his nature that uh, inconsistent with the spirit of true religion, he writes. I and some of my friends were and still are firm uh, 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 believers in the doctrine of non-resistance to evil. Experience from dis disobedience to the authorities in Pretoria mean for him that passive resistance is able to win their brute force retreatment. On April 1910, uh, Gandhi sent Tolstoy a third letter and his work, Hind Swaraj. 
Tolstoy spent a few days reading the book. As he was seriously ill, he wrote a short reply. I just received your letter and your book, The Indian Home Rule. I read your book with great interest because think the questions you treat is in uh, the path of resistance, a question of greatest importance, not only for India, but for the whole humanity. Uh, and uh, the, in one of the letters, which he, he uh, when reads of the book addressed to Gandhi, the more I live, the more I feel inclined to express to others the feeling which so strongly moved by being and which, according to my opinion, are of great importance. That is what one calls non-resistance. It is in reality nothing else but the dis discipline of love uh, undermined the false in interpretation. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, of course, uh, I would like to conclude uh, uh, that recently in uh, Moscow, the Russian edition of Gandhi's Outstanding Leadership, written by Ambassador Pascal uh, Alan Nazareth, was released at the Institute of Philosophy of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov contributed a foreword uh, to the book. He termed the book a gold mine of Mahatma Gandhi's statements on the widest range of issues, giving an all encompassing view of his philosophy of nonviolence and his applicability to contemporary nation and international issues. Uh, I think that uh, a publication of this book was also the one of the demonstration of soft power and relationship between our uh, science between our institutions and between our uh, uh, countries. I think that this relationship of the, our great thinkers of uh, India and Russia and give the best example of the soft power and many aspects of our life and educational uh, uh, problems as well. And I think that in uh, future, I hope, that we will uh, have uh, our, develop our relationship with the Indian Center for Soft Power, with the Indian Center for Sport Power and Indian Foundation, and Russian Academy of Sciences, and Russian Center for Indian Studies. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, thank you very much. For the presentation and uh, we've seen the all pervasive influence of Gandhi, uh, Gandhiji um, in Russia just as we have grown up reading Tolstoy, Dostoevsky and Mac Maxim Gorky in our growing years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well next I invite Dr. Shaunaka Das and he's going to tell us about the development of Hindu studies in Oxford University and his journey. Uh, Namaskar, Subramatam, um, Professor Singh, fellow panelists, and I would like to thank the organizers for uh, uh, bringing us together at this, at this very interesting conference. Um, I wasn't actually going to talk about my journey. Um, <laughs> uh, I can, but you'd be very bored. Um, I thought, considering the context of the conference, I would deliver my presentation with the soft power of diplomacy. And then I remembered that I was Irish. So I thought, <laughs> who am I kidding? Uh, so I don't aim to offend with my remarks today. I want to offer them with concern and care. And I pray for your <coughs> blessings that I can. Education is global and universal. Sorry? Yeah. Education is global and universal. And as we've heard, it's not Indian. Yet India can contribute profoundly to the global knowledge base, to sustainable influence in thought leadership, and to global decision making. Indian seers and sages offered us their thinking and example to the Loka Sangraha, for the welfare of all, for a global and universal welfare. This is the ethos of learning in Indian traditions. 
how will we define education? So I, I, I'm looking to a non-Hindu to define Hindu education or Indian education for us. Uh, Albert Einstein said, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. And here we make a distinction between training, which is cramming for an exam, and education, which means learning how to think. India is a global player in many fields, but not in humanities education, especially regarding its own thought and culture. It can be, and I would propose that it should be. Indian literature is full of examples of excellent educational practice and clear principles underpinning education. I would mention two principles, that of Acharya and Icha, meaning desire. The story of Acharya, I first heard the concept of Acharya when I was nine years old in Ireland in the 1960s. This is the power of Indian soft, the influence. Um, my brother came home and he'd been smoking cigarettes. And my mother had this mystic power that she could discern these things very quickly. He walked in the door and she just looked at him and said, you've been smoking cigarettes. And uh, she started to chastise him. And my father turned around and said, you can't chastise him. And the house went silent. This, this had never been said before to my mother, that she couldn't do anything. And my father had picked a perfect time, educationally. Then he went on to tell a story, and many of you may have heard this story. He told the story about Gandhi. I've heard it in other contexts as well. The story he told <clears throat> was that a woman went to Gandhiji with her child and said, Gandhiji, please tell my child to stop eating so much sugar. And Gandhiji said, bring him back in three days. So she brought him back in three days, and he said, now, Betta, listen to your mother. Don't eat so much sugar. Always be kind to your mother. And then... The mother said, well, why did I have to come back in three days? And he said, because three days ago, I was also eating sugar. <laughs> As such a powerful message, such a powerful principle of education, what it means to educate, one who teaches by example, Acharya. And it is, without doubt, the essential principle behind education in an Indian, co Indian context, maybe in any context. And also, I would suggest the essential principle behind good government. Icha means desire, but in the context of the Bhagavad Gita, it means choice. So in the Gita, Arjuna has a nervous breakdown. He falls apart. He turns to Krishna and says, help. And Krishna starts to give him all kinds of choices. Now, this is the Bhagavad Gita, the song of God. So from a religious point of view, we expect God just to tell him what to do. Bas. The whole thing is over in two minutes. But that's not what happens. He gives him all kinds of choices. Some of them are quite ridiculous. He says, if you don't fight, people will think you're a coward and they'll laugh at you. A totally materialistic perspective. And he gives him all kinds of other choices and yoga and sitting down on a deerskin and looking at the tip of your nose and Arjuna, a kshatriya, kind of goes, I can't do that. And he says, in my opinion, you could consider this, you could consider, in my opinion, in my opinion, that God has an opinion. And at the end, he says, now deliberate on this fully and do what you wish to do. Do as you desire. He gives him choice. This is not a dogmatic text. This is not a doctrinaire text. This is a revolutionary form of educational theory. Now, let's take it into the home. Your child is going clubbing for the first time. Now, you know when they go clubbing, it's sex and drugs and rock and roll. And you don't want them to be involved in that stuff. So you tell them all the things they're not supposed to do and the things they are supposed to do and to be home by 11 o'clock. If you're not home, you're grounded, etc. But what if you had a sensible conversation about sex and drugs and rock and roll so that they could think about it? So when they get to the party and someone says, try this, try this, it's fun, try it, try it, it's fun, because that's not a choice. That's just pressure. What if you've actually given them choice? This is the practical application of such a dynamic educational theory. Imagine bringing that into the schools of India, giving children actual choice, critical choice. <clears throat> global education and learning should be global, but it's not. Indian intellectual culture, its theories and methods of critical thought are not being seriously studied anywhere in the world, especially in India. How then can we have a global dialogue about how to study Indian traditions and cultures? 
In global terms, the accepted norms of scholarship are not being questioned by Indian scholars. Thus, the rules of academic discourse are set by one culture alone, resulting in a discourse without parity of esteem. This canon should be changed. But if Indian scholars don't take this seriously, why should others? And if India doesn't take this seriously, Indians can't complain when others become the world experts in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism, and the academic study of the Indian arts, the plastic, plastic culture, and even Bollywood. Globalization needs to mean more than economic and political parity. It needs to mean a meeting of intellectual and spiritual traditions as well. Without such an addition to the global framework, we will continue to live in an intellectually colonial context. And silence in that context means consent. India must find its voice, not a strident, aggrieved, bitter, or backward-looking voice, but an educated, thoughtful voice, one with a modern <coughs> melody, hearing from the past and speaking to the future in the present. In less poetic terms, India needs to use its brains. I would like to suggest that India's primary soft power lies in the knowledge base found in its literature, thought, and cultures. Much of what has been discussed at this conference is included in the arena of India's cultures. But in the field of education, we begin to encounter the thinking behind these fields. Because of more than 40 years of worldwide exposure to and practice of yoga, the thinking behind yoga, Ayurveda, Ahimsa, Vedanta, and Bhakti, are now areas of great interest in the world, of great practical interest. This is a natural development and testifies to the influence of Indian soft power. How is this need for more knowledge to be satisfied if India can't satisfy the global inquiry in a scholarly way, rationally, with integrity, and with reference to its own texts and practices? Well, someone else will do it. India has already missed out on the $10 billion yoga industry, where even yoga paraphernalia designed and produced in the US is sold in India. If smart, India will get ahead of the game, invest in research and education, and become the world leader in yoga philosophy, Indian thought, Indian religion. <coughs> the next phase of the global yoga movement is interested in these subjects. If we think education is expensive, let's continue living in ignorance. But let's not complain at the even higher dividends, the billions that will be made from giving away a heritage without thought. Billions which could pay for the whole educational enterprise. If we are not thinking how to fund education, we're not thinking. And why bother with these musty old texts? I would like to uh, all equality legislation across the world, including India. If we look again to the Bhagavad Gita or into the Upanishads, we find a concept of samadarshanaha, equal vision. This is another idea of equality, based on the concept, oh, confirmed, based on the concept of atma, of the self being transcendent to the material. In the Gita, the samadarshana means that you look at the living energy in a Brahmin, in a dog eater, in a dog, in an elephant, in a cow and you see them equally, you respect them equally. That principle is not gender specific, it's not racist, but it's also species. If we look at the area of human rights, so we heard that Hansa Mehta was able to take the word man out of the Universal Declaration and put in human, which was an advance. Let's look at maybe another advance. There is no discourse in Indian texts about human rights. You look at any of these texts, there's no discussion about it anywhere because the whole focus is on being a right human. That's a very different way of looking at the world. <coughs> human rights means I'm concerned that you take care of me. Being a right human means I'm concerned about taking care of you. This is axiomatically different in philosophical terms. And this as a, a part of social discourse makes a huge difference not only in an Indian context but in a global context. This is a, a, a higher way of thinking about the subject, I would suggest. We also look at the issues of climate change. Climate change on the whole is about horror stories of what's going to happen when everything warms up. India's warm enough, we might think. It's about science, it's about statistics. 
But in an Indian context, it's about dharma. It's about doing the right thing. The reason why you take care of the environment is because it's the right thing to do. No other reason. You don't have to be threatened to do it. This is a new narrative. The narrative of climate science is one of fear. This is a positive narrative. And, and this is for Indian Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Jews, atheists, everyone. This is an issue of Indian citizenship. It comes directly from Indian culture. These examples are not part of global discourse because even nationally, people shy away from them. They don't have enough knowledge, enough education to, in the subject to sustain an argument. Yet these challenges are positive and can lead to Loka Sangraha. India has an important and I would say crucial contribution to make in global thought leadership. Thought leadership in the fields of law, as we've discussed, political theory, social policy, economics, philosophy, theology, environmental theory, culture, civilization, leadership, executive education, values education, and in issues of migration, integration, social cohesion, and citizenship. What is needed is a strategic vision, tactical planning, and funding. The first step in developing education, according to Indian traditional principles, and I would suggest common sense, is finding teachers. Currently, for subject areas including spirituality, philosophy, culture, and religion, they hardly exist. This is very much a ground-up development. There are many scholars around the world who are more than willing to help. Much thought has gone into the kind of curriculum needed, a whole new approach to the study of philosophy, culture, and religion. We are not alone in this. Change means change. India needs to show its youth that its values, its philosophies, theologies, languages, literature, and cultural heritage are our value. I can academically study Hinduism in Oxford. I can't in Delhi. If these subjects don't appear in the Indian educational system, young people won't value them. And more seriously, India will be seen as failing to give their youth educational choice and that is definitely contrary to Indian thought. If India wants to understand its own mind, to own its own cultures, to speak for itself from its own heritage, India needs to get off its asan and do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Das, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, Humanity is uh, being absent Indian, uh, from the Indian education perspective, uh, humanities world over does not seem to reflect the Indian knowledge system. I think that's something to think about and work on. But one point that uh, I cannot resist but bring to the fore here is what you spoke about the climate change. And I think if we go back to our Rig Veda, there are 63 sutras in Bhumi Sutkam there, uh, which talk about climate change, environment, which are so very relevant for today's times. I think they still continue to be relevant. And uh, are we studying that? No. Is that part of our curricula? No. So I think an effort must be made in this direction. So I quite agree with you, with your points there. So let's let's... Uh, re-envision our own knowledge systems. Uh, with that, I, I now have the pleasure of inviting uh, 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 Dr. Subhash Kak, and he is going to speak uh, on um, Indian education system, technology, history as well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, take off uh, a couple of points that uh, Dr. Sunaina Singh made uh, early on, that uh, her university and other places, there may be courses uh, being offered on, um, uh, on Indian subjects, but there may not be an, enough of an interest uh, amongst students, maybe just a few, but not the numbers that we want. <coughs> Uh, so the question arises, why is that happening? And I was having uh, a conversation with um, one of you uh, the other night, and um, he said 
uh, what's happened in the last uh, three or four hundred years after the Enlightenment is that uh, the Western idea of universalism triumphed. And it has been going strong and it's been internalized in India as well. And uh, although uh, a lot of Indians, maybe everybody is aware of uh, uh, the Indian perspective, the Upanishads and so on, they think uh, it doesn't have the kind of value that the Western universal narrative has. And therefore, they would rather do that. And maybe at some point in time in their lives, they would come back to it at a personal <coughs> level. So this is the reason why I thought I would take this as a starting point to step back and look at the very premise of uh, this claim of the triumph of Western universalism. And where does it stand now? And is there any place for uh, the Indian view? Because I would like to um, make the case in the next four or five minutes that I have that perhaps there is also an Indian universal perspective on the world. And maybe uh, there are enough reasons, if you step back and look at what's the, the larger currents, uh, that uh, things might change. And if that changes, then one would see a lot more people trying to understand the world in a different way. And to, to put this in context, I go back to the little story I mentioned uh, on Monday, Monday evening, about uh, this uh, huge study with a lot of investment by the US government in getting 30 odd uh, leading scientists and physicists and computer scientists and philosophers and neuroscientists together to see where science is going, not necessarily in the next 5, 10, 15 years, but say 50 or 100 years. And, uh, and I was one of them. And the uh, conclusion that people arrived at uh, they were not talking about uh, um, culture stories from different parts of the world. They were looking at the whole problem from the perspective of science and logic. And the conclusions, and there was only one Indian, that was me. They were Americans and Europeans. So about half of them said that the way to approach reality is a shunyata, the madhyamika system. Shunyata, there is nothing. There's nothing but emptiness, and out of that, arises uh, uh, the mind. And we are, of course, uh, you know, we have minds and uh, uh, society and science and everything comes out of it. And the other half said, well, there is uh, something more than shunyata, which is, uh, you know, the, the Atman, which uh, transcends uh, the minds. And therefore, uh, the conclusion was, uh, or the, there was a split, 50% people uh, believing that computers will eventually become conscious, which of course leads to very frightening uh, possibilities because if computers are conscious, they won't need us. And perhaps um, humanity will, will be finished. And the other 50% believing that there was a fundamental difference and, uh, and uh, this uh, principle of Atman is, uh, what uh, distinguishes us from uh, machines. And that is the Indian universalism, because what is the Indian universal idea? The Western universal idea was that we are all things and objects, right? That's how uh, after mm, you know, New Newton and his uh, successors, uh, this whole approach of looking at classical uh, mathematical principles and applying them not only to uh, physical objects or chemistry and biology, but also to society developed. Uh, but all that uh, um, approach has uh, reached a kind of a dead end in different perspectives. It's reached a dead end in physics itself because only the theories that we have exclude 96% of the physical cosmos, which is dark matter and dark energy. And all of the sciences, including biology or psychology, have no place for self. And there is something called self, because we all are convinced, even though somebody else might tell us that we are automata or we do things only by instinct, we are sure there's something much more. And then we have anecdotal, anecdotal accounts 
of individuals, creativity and so on, and some of which I did go over, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Uh, now, I just want to address very briefly this split between shunyata, generally called the Buddhist perspective on reality, and Vedanta, which is wh where people were at. Now, uh, the, the series of workshops, uh, week-long workshops we had, were not uh, for people who were very knowledgeable about uh, the sutras and all that. But uh, it so turns out that uh, in the Mahayana uh, Mahapari Nirvana Sutra, uh, the Buddha, when he was dying, is approached by his, uh, uh, his, his disciples, and they're crying. And then they say, you're, you're going to go away. What's going to happen to us? And then he gives this sermon, which is one of the great scriptures of Mahayana Buddhism, where he says that, look, I did in all these years, in all these decades, say that there is not Atman. This is the doctrine of Anatta or Anatma. But I said that for the following reason. Just as a little baby who's being uh, given the breast by his mother, let's say he falls sick, and this is the story, I'm trying to paraphrase it, falls sick and the mother goes to the doctor, the doctor says uh, the baby should be put on this medication for so many days and the baby should not have your milk. And after the baby has recovered, then the baby can come back to the milk. So, uh, so the baby, she comes back with the medication and the baby starts crying. She say, the baby says, I want milk. And uh, she says, look, uh, there's something wrong. She puts something bitter on her breast and she says, it's this poison and you, ca you cannot drink the milk. And so the baby cries uh, and after a few days, the baby becomes well and then she washes off that bitter thing and then she tells the baby that it's now okay. Uh, I told this to you because it was not good for you. And then the Buddha concludes, he says, you were all too attached to the idea of Atman, which is why I felt it was necessary for you to be separated from that attachment. But now that you have lived all this life as my disciples and gained the necessary insight and wisdom and compassion about all, now you can come back to the idea of Atman. So in other words, in the Mahapari Nirvan Sutra, the Buddha eventually does embrace the Veda, which is an amazing thing. So in other words, all the scientists that we were there did agree that this idea of Indian universalism, which is the same as Western universalism, accepting there is an added transcending category of Atman, of consciousness. Uh, which is all for everybody. It's, it's, it's a universal idea. And this is the idea which is going to change the world in many, many different ways. Because in, in, in certain ways, this is the most dangerous time for humanity. Uh, and uh, we mentioned that briefly the other day because uh, AI and computer technology is going to make human beings redundant. And if we're really nothing but machines, then even if we had all food to eat and, and access to the internet and um, access to watching as many movies as we wanted, uh, we wouldn't be happy with it for too long. Maybe as we are growing up as children, maybe in the 20s, what they've discovered is at some point, you would be, you would be extremely unhappy. And there is at least uh, the claim that all the opioid epidemic deaths, you know, 70,000 last year in the US, and these are people in the prime of their lives, in their 30s, you know, young parents, why are they doing it? It's because this Western universal idea, universalism, which did wonderful things because it made science grow to where it has reached, which is astonishing um, stuff that we have come, we've gotten access to, but it's probably, not probably, most certainly run its course. And the world is ready 
for another idea, the idea of science plus, science meaning outer science, plus, uh, plus the idea of consciousness, which is why uh, the smart people everywhere in all fields are talking about the need for the development of a science of consciousness, which is, of course, nothing but the, the Veda. The Veda is the science of consciousness. What the Veda says is that there is rith, meaning laws and order, which works. Everything is ordered. But paradoxically, paradoxically, paradoxically on the surface, there is consciousness which uh, electrifies everything, which provides uh, the basis of all that happens. And it was expressed in all amazing uh, ideas, and I'll just talk about two of them. Uh, one is the idea of Ishvara. We have Shiva is the witness within each one of us, right? Now, as we know, uh, those of us who have looked at uh, uh, yantra diagrams in the tantric tradition, you have the Sri Chakra, for example, which is a representation of the cosmos, both the outer cosmos and the physical cosmos or the inner cosmos. But as you know, at the very center of the Sri Chakra is an invisible dot, and that is Shiva. So what does it really mean? It means that the more you look for consciousness within you, because it's not an object, you will not find it. Shiva is, or Atman, or consciousness, is the experiencing subject who is one. There are not many objects. And now, to conclude, uh, Dr. S uh, Sunaina Singh tells me that my time is almost up, maybe a minute. Uh, and we, we all do know that uh, the astonishing uh, advances in uh, modern science were also informed uh, by Indian ideas. Not everybody is aware of it. For example, uh, the, the, the development of quantum mechanics itself by uh, Schrodinger, uh, who was a Vedantist, an Austrian, uh, brought in consciousness because quantum mechanics, consciousness, and the physical universe are a complementary pair. Uh, then um, the whole wireless revolution, E is equal to MC square. Vivekananda and Nikola Tesla met in 1896. Sarah Bernhardt threw a party in New York City, and she uh, and uh, Vivekananda told uh, uh, Nikola Tesla, who's one of the most famous guys of his times in the 1890s, that look, according to Vaisheshika, mass, the the ultimately mass and energy are interconvertible. So he said. Can you, find, can you find the math for it? And of course, he was beaten to it by uh, Albert Einstein, although there is a theory, um, I don't know whether it's a sound theory, that as we know, Einstein's wife was a Serbian, and she had been in correspondence with Tesla, who was the most famous Serbian of his times. And so there are some people, probably not with uh, irrefutable evidence, who suggest that perhaps the germ of the idea may have come to Einstein from Tesla through his wife. So with this, I conclude. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and I would be glad to, you know, amplify any of this should you have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaur. You know, right from the Vedic times, I think uh, the Vedas put it very clearly, what you just spoke about, about consciousness, and that was Atmanavidhi, you know, realization of the self. That was the end of education. Uh, so with that, uh, I now have the pleasure of inviting uh, Dr. Ramdas Nam, and uh, he will talk to us about uh, religious studies uh, in, uh, and I Indian think the teaching of religious Wonderful, teaching of religious studies. Welcome. <coughs> Okay, um, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for the organizers for this, um, for, for Dr. Singh for um, chairing this session. Um, I wanna start by saying that I'm going to reiterate some of the things we already said um, about education in India and the real paucity of what's going on here. 
Uh, thus far during the conference, we've heard a lot of discussions about soft power, um, how it's understood, how it's defined, the ways in which it manifests and shapes the preferences of other nations and peoples um, about, well, in this case, India, right? Um, and of the different categories, culture is one of the most pivotal uh, elements of soft power and fundamental to utilizing this power is for people to understand their history, its development, its multiplicity, its beliefs and practices, its values. Um, if I'm gonna use soft power, I have to understand it. Uh, it is here we're learning about the history of the various indigenous religious traditions uh, and cultures is, possible, is pivotal, and yet in India it's not possible, um, as has been mentioned. Uh, it's almost impossible uh, in government schools to get anything uh, of substance about Indian culture, uh, religious traditions, etc., And so this really prevents this. Without this knowledge, uh, how are Indians supposed to truly understand their culture, um, historical roots, sources of, and reasons for their cultural traditions? Without this knowledge, they can't tap into this form of soft power. Um, something has to change. Consider for a moment, um, India has long been an enigma for nations and peoples in the world. Uh, she has inspired entry, fascination, creativity, spirituality, self-discovery uh, in the hearts of people all over the world. Of course, at the same time, she's inspired greed, jealousy, longing, and the egos of those wishing to possess her and her riches. For centuries, the latter have stolen and desecrated from her while suppressing and killing her peoples and, her, and attempting to kill her cultural traditions. Yet amidst it all, India has survived and flourished. And why is this? It's because of the ground foundational strength of culture. Um, while her future lies on one level in the external wealth, power, and greatness that is increasing daily, the foundation upon which any lasting success will be built is the deep cultural traditions from which, uh, through which India was built um, and that fostered and facilitated her growth and her survival over the last thousand years. Um, it was mentioned earlier on in the conference that the last thousand years is a sign of the decline of India, and I think the last thousand years is a sign of her survival um, amidst all of the external forces attempting to take over and destroy her. Uh, so my talk today is gonna specifically focus on this aspect of culture, how and why um, it should be learned and what it can do to offer the rest of the world. Long before people in the other parts of the world turned within for the purpose of self-discovery, um, that process began in India. It began in Indus Valley, Saraswati Valleys that we know of. Uh, excavations point to the presence of various aspects of yoga, um, developing in a culture that also focused on purity, sense of equality, nonviolence. While tribes of peoples in most of the other places of the world were warring over their neighbors for basic material wealth, Indians were learning to look within. Um, this is one of the main reasons why India fascinated almost everyone who came to know about her her people, her traditions, her wealth. Um, as Professor Singh kind of mentioned, uh, actually pointed out, this wisdom is not being given to Indian students today, and, and this has to change. Uh, as a professor of religion at the University of Hawaii, um, and I've had a, about 11,000 students, 10,000 at least, um, I've taught basic world religion course. And, it, and, and I teach three types of courses. This first course is an intro level to world religions. And a second is a, in, is a focus just on India. And then the third is a graduate level where I focus on different aspects of India. In the first, students begin by learning about indigenous religious traditions, those born in the culture of a people, um, usually in a particular geographic environment, and, and how, these people, how these traditions have developed their beliefs and practices in order to create a life of harmony within their communities. And of, of all the indigenous traditions in the world, Hinduism is the largest. Uh, and so therefore, it becomes a, 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 an important vehicle for students to learn about how to study uh, indigenous traditions and how they can uh, manifest and, and diversify. So I spend about, in that, in that course, I spend about the first five weeks just talking about the Dharma traditions in India, about all four of them. Um, and then I turn for the next four weeks to the East and I go to China and I look at um, Taoism, Confucianism, Chinese Buddhism, and then to Korea and Japan, and in Japan, Shinto and Japanese Buddhism. And then after that, I go into the Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So I give the students um, a, a covering of, the, of all the traditions, most of which they know nothing about, including their own. 
Um, in fact, I have many Christians that come up to me after I talk about something in, in Christianity, and they'll come up to me and they go, so, oh, so that's why we do what we do, or that's why we think what we think. They, they have no clue. Right? I mean, you can ask them, you can ask a Methodist, what's the difference between you and a Lutheran? They'd say, well, I go to Methodist church. And that's the extent of they know, that they know the difference. Um, so I focus on the development um, of, of these various traditions. And this way students get a solid, um, albeit brief and basic, grounding in the understanding of religious beliefs and practices that have influenced the world. And this is really important because if you understand the basic concepts of why a people think and do what they do, you are less afraid of them. And I've had students over the years come up to me and say, I, you know, I'm, after, re, after learning about this, I'm not so afraid of them, whoever them happen to be. Um, so in my second course, I focus on India. Second level, of course. So I spend the whole semester, 16 weeks, focusing just on the Dharma traditions. Once again, I start in the Saraswati um, Indus Valley, uh, where yoga and ascetic practices seem to have had their genesis. Um, I introduced concepts of tapasya austerity, uh, how it became an integral part of many subsequent denominations, obviously Buddhism, Jainism, etc. Uh, in addressing the Vedic period and the rituals and chants that tell us much about the people, I bring back the concept of asceticism, how it, how it continued to play a role. Um, I then go to the Upanishads and the development of this rich philosophical systems that have, that have inspired thinkers all over the world. Uh, Subhash referred to that. Um, including present-day contemporary philosophers and scientists, one of my favorite um, scientists, David Bohm, who was pivotal in quantum mechanics, um, also was a disciple of Krishnamurti. Um, and I turn to the Pranic period, the corpus of Indian mythology, the Bhakti and Tantra traditions, the ascetic groups like the Nats and the Ramananda Sampradaya, and how each of these added new dimensions to the fabric of Indian culture and life. Um, as my students are learning about this, they, they are, they are, I can see their eyes opening up and I can see their minds expanding and understanding India in a very different way that they learned in their history class. Uh, the next tradition that I introduce is then Sikhi or Sikhism. And here I tell the students about all of the ten gurus, uh, about their lives, their teachings, and also what's important, what led the tradition to adopt a militaristic aspect of it in order to survive um, the attempts by for foreign rulers and armies to destroy them. And, and I give a context for that development. Um, and then lastly, I look at British colonialism and how successfully it took over not only the land of the people, but the mind of many Indians. Macaulay convincing all Indians that English is the only decent language and you should give up your other languages, and, and many Indians have done that. Uh, and so we see that being played out today. Uh, the last course I do is a graduate course I focus on specific aspects. So for one semester, for example, we'll just do talk about yoga. Um, another one, I'll, I'll, we'll read Bhakti poets, we'll read Surdas, we'll read uh, Mira, um, Tukaram, Tulsidas, etc. Um, and in this way, my students are able to really go in depth in studying about these traditions. Um, the reality is that Hinduism and the other Dharma traditions are the only major world religions religious traditions in the world today that are not taught by their own people in their own homelands. So in America and in the Western world, Judaism is taught by Jews, Christianity by Christians, Muslim, Islam by Muslims, Sikhism by Sikhs, Buddhism by Buddhists, and everybody else teaches Hinduism. No, no Hindus, except for some of us. <laughs> you know, it took, we, we had to be reborn, we had to be born with a foreign body in order to be able to teach religion, for some reason, Hinduism. <laughs> and, you know, whatever works, I guess, you know. But that, that's what we're trying to do. And there are many of us that are really, that, that are attempting to do this. What I bring into my courses is that, and that what, what I think people can learn from the Hindu tradition is the concepts of religious diversity, of tolerance, of nonviolence, yoga, self-control, inner search for enlightenment, they all have their birth in the religious cultures of India. So let me make a proposal. First, elementary school levels. Students should be taught basic concepts about religious cultures. Something as simple as festivals and things like this. Um, the Hinduism today, and many of you know that, um, the 
the temple in on Kauai, and near the home, near my island, um, we all we're all in Hawaii. Um, they do some terrific work on basic education about Hinduism. Their, their book here, The History of Hindu India, is for sixth graders, um, and it is a wonderful book. It's very non. Um, confrontational, it's very basic, and yet it helps students to understand. This is what students now can read in public schools in America, but they can't read it in India. Something's got to change. Um, Southern Australia, the state of Southern Australia, they start very early level, and every year they teach different aspects of, of religion. And they do a very comparative thing, which like I do in my world religion class. But they do it on, on a other basic level. I, I get a little bit more challenging. I look at the good and bad of the various traditions at, at the public school level, K through 12. You don't have to do that. Just give some basic understanding, right? Um, denominational structure, something about dress, family, um, et cetera. Once students enter college, then uh, in the course I like to teach that integrates these kind of history, social science, humanities courses, you can bring all of that in and, and, and give the concepts of Hindu values uh, and Indian values uh, in those. And I think it's really important and it's very possible. Ignorance breeds fear. Fear breeds hatred. And, and that in turn leads to violence. Um, if we don't want violence in the world, we have to understand each other. And we can't understand each other if, if, <laughs> if we don't learn about them. And yet, for some reason in India, the, the fear of, of studying about ourselves. I think the present government has a real opportunity to change this. Um, and I hope that this can happen. I hope that, that, that um, people can find a way to really look into these things, look into the concepts that are rooted in Indian culture and make them a part of public education today. When I talk to my students, um, I just wrote down a thing real quick. When I talk to my students about the Indian tradition and the, and the kind of the values and the concepts, the ones that really get to them is first of all omnipresence. Hindus are the only ones that actually believe omnipresence. Christians say they believe omnipresence and, and I've talked with Christian theologians. They say, oh yeah, God is everywhere. And I say, okay, is God in this? Oh no. Is God in this? Oh no. Is God in me? Oh no. Is God in that? Oh no. So God is everywhere but nowhere. Right? Hindus are the only ones that say, oh yeah, God's in everything. And so because we actually walk our talk and take it seriously, the issue of environment came up. We know that the environment is divine. And therefore, it is our duty to respect the environment. And I think environmentalism, true environmentalism, has its roots in the concept, in the Hindu concept of omnipresence. And nonviolence. When you know that animals have a soul just like us, then you have to rethink before we kill them or oppress them. And then the concept of rebirth. <laughs> I've had students, because you know, most Christians, I think, you know, you're born and then you either go to heaven and hell when you die. So when I talk about the concepts of rebirth, I've had students come up to me afterwards and say, so if I convert to Hinduism, do I get to be reborn? <laughs> I tell them, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to convert, and you'll still be reborn. Anyway, <laughs> and because of that, there's no concept of hell, no permanent hell. And that is what so many of the Western traditions used to scare people. I mean, my cousins, <laughs> I was raised as a Catholic. I thought I wanted to be a priest when I was young. Fortunately, I read Gandhi when I was eight years old, believe it or not. Um, I was given a little kid's book on Gandhi and I read it and I decided <laughs> that's what I wanted. Um, because those basic concepts of nonviolence, uh, those basic concepts of truth are really important. And our students are getting it. Our students, we're able to share that with our students. They can't get it here, and, and we need to do something. And, we, and hopefully, um, you know, we can all support uh, a, a proposal to the government to, to help that process. I know that there's many in the government. I know Ram Madhavji is here, and I know that he supports an openness and a way of thinking um, that I'm talking about. So um, I, I hope this can happen, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ram Daislam. You know, Yesya Devi Parabhaktir Yatha Guru Yatha Devi Tatha Guru I think that's exactly what you have uh, just explicated to us because India is enigmatic. I think there is need to look at Vedic studies or Hindu studies and uh, 
uh, Indian education system needs to be remodeled and reshaped, where we do give uh, respect to our own texts. I think that that's, that's the end of what you have said. And now I have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Kohn. I have the pleasure and the challenge of saying as few things as possible in as short a time as possible, or rather as many things as possible in as short a time as possible. Now, uh, I would like to divide these few reflections into three parts. Uh, the first would be a very quick uh, reminder of what uh, India has contributed and um, essentially created. Because when we talk about soft power, the highest form of soft power is authority. Not in the sense that is normally understood now in politics, but rather authorship. What has been coming from you, which essentially means from the higher self. And whenever we define education, I like to quote uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan when he said education is a fulfillment of yourself and offering of yourself to the Supreme, Ishwara Pranidhana. So it is yoga. And unfortunately, this has been largely forgotten world over because there is no sense of what the connection between you and the Supreme is in the dominant global culture. So how to bring it back? Some speakers have pointed to the testimony of science and to its inevitable conclusion that you cannot educate the individual self if you do not bring it into harmony, rhythm, with the higher self. And rhythm generates both rhythm and right, ritual. So it is our work today, in the light of the ecological crisis and of the knowledge crisis, to go beyond aparavidya into vidya vidyanam, the knowledge of knowledge, just as we have to be conscious of our consciousness, we have to be aware of our knowledge and therefore of our ignorance. So the limit to knowledge, the self-acceptance of the limit of our knowledge is fundamental to having real knowledge. And that's why it proceeds as it were by negation. But in practical terms, if we look at the connection between the highest reality <coughs> And the achievements in this world, we see that India has been a continuous source. We know about China, Japan, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, but we should also know about its impact on Greece through the Yavanas, and even before through the various peoples such as the Kassites and Mitannis. And the fact that Christianity was born not into a Hebrew background as such, but into an Aramaic background. An Aramaic was spoken as far back as Northwestern India. It was the uh, lingua franca of the Persian Empire, and it therefore was written in Karoshti script in uh, the East. And through that, you can understand why a lot of the teachings or so-called Gnostic or esoteric teachings of uh, the Christos, of Yeshua, were actually uh, directly derived from both the Hindu and Buddhist perspectives. I mean, when he says, I and my father are one, that is very much Tatwa Masi. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the very, um, you know, nominalistic and the very um, structured perspective of Western thought, which emerged with the Greeks, uh, we have seen the loss of the spiritual, of the transcendental meaning, of the trans-religious meaning of things, which have become literal. And as we know, the letter kills. The spirit gives life, but the letter kills if it is devoid of the spirit. So again, for us to essentially rebuild, revamp an educational system, not only valid for India, but for the world, we do have to analyze critically the perspective of the Enlightenment philosophy. And paradoxically, perhaps the greatest French Enlightenment philosopher, Voltaire, was a great admirer of Brahminical wisdom. And he felt that uh, there was uh, no uh, greater truth than uh, the message of complete nonviolence and uh, respect for all life 
that was practiced, at least in theory, in India. And this is from 1768, so 20 years before the French Revolution and a few years after the Battle of Plassey. So you see the perception of India as a decadent culture was not yet there. I think it was brought in by the missionaries and by the colonizers, and for very obvious reasons. You know, knowledge is power, education is power, and a friend of mine yeah, likes that uh, expression, the masters of discourse. Who decides what you believe? Now, we all know about the great thesis of American uh, social scientists, such as uh, uh, Huntington and Fukuyama, and as we know, these views are pushed very, very actively by the government of the United States and by other governments allied to it. So there is more of it, there is more to it than just an individual thought. It becomes a state policy and therefore a way of influencing and of controlling what's happening. So there is no great mystery behind the fact that there is strong resistance in official quarters in many parts of the world to introducing an Indian I wouldn't call it Indian, but for the sake of practicality and also for the sake of historical accuracy, I would say an Indic or a Bharatiya perspective, because that would challenge the very foundations of Western power. Now, Western power is slowly dissolving, but it's still fighting back. And we can see how much it is fighting back through very corrosive perspectives that are being propagated in India. Deconstructionism, Marxism, the very analysis of things in historical terms. History is a good servant, but very bad master. And when you try to analyze a historical tradition, or rather a philosophical tradition, agnostic tradition, in the light of history, you can take it apart to the point where nobody will make any sense of it anymore. And that is exactly what unfortunately is happening in many departments of Indology in the Western world. So that is why there is such a critical task of taking over that field Cooperatively, there are well-meaning and well-prepared minds all over the world who can connect, perhaps not so much in the social sciences, but in the physical sciences and in the humanities. Therefore, there can be a sort of a, an international alliance to correct the misconceptions and the enduring prejudices, uh, which are very often supported, funded, bolstered by very clear missionary intents from certain creeds. And I'm not only talking about religious creeds, I'm talking about financial creeds and about political creeds. And in that light, I think the opportunities have never been greater because China, in a way, is looking for its path. And China was never greater than when it had integrated Buddhism with its native traditions, Confucianism and Taoism. And if you look at the history of the last 2,000 years, you realize that no great power became predominant in the world without being in some way closely connected to India. The Portuguese in the 16th century, the Dutch in the 17th, the British and the French in the 18th and 19th. That tells you that in a way, as they say in England, the jewel in the crown, because without that access to the source, there is no way that a power was able to prevail either commercially or spiritually. And that's what's happening today in the US with essentially the deep penetration of Indian people and Indian ideas in the high-tech industry. I remember in America when I first went there in 1983, I heard a young, um, I, a young uh, entrepreneur who was starting a company called uh, Apple. And he was already talking about his trip to India and about how uh, that had essentially shaped his approach to high tech. Now, there are many other examples. Most of them are not well known because, let's face it, in the West, not too many people at level in the ranks of power are interested in propagating this because it goes against a fundamental belief, which is the supremacy of Western Enlightenment rationalism. That, however, is changing. So riding that wave, I think that, after all, you know, yata pragnyam, hi sambhavam. So that is exactly what we have to generate, create a new consciousness, and all means, literature, films, that's where I think, again, that, as we saw yesterday, powerful films that reflect an ideal and a vision are very important. But, of course, more than making films, Distributing them is, is the challenge. 
And I think now there are opportunities because of major Indian corporations that have entered Hollywood and that can have access to global distribution networks. Otherwise, you know, as uh, it was said yesterday, very few films actually are watched by anybody who is not an Indophile. So that has to change. But of course, the spirit of Indian films also has to be conducive to what we want to achieve. Just like books written about India have to reflect the core. You know, otherwise, if you are just talk reading about social problems in India, crisis in India, and all the things that shouldn't happen, it doesn't exactly serve the purpose. So I will leave you with these very few thoughts, and I hope that the India Foundation and the other organizations to which I'm deeply grateful for doing all this wonderful work and getting together so many uh, amazing minds and so many people who are working in so many ways among us to spread the message of India, how that can lead to a real evolution, to a real enlightenment, to a real opening of the world to the Dharma. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have uh, grossly overshot the time, uh, but in fitness of things, we'll just allow two questions. Just two questions, I can see Ambassador Gupta there and one there. Yeah, just two of them, please. Take both the questions. I'm sorry, sir, I saw him first, so we just don't have time. Just give here first. Yeah. I will take both the questions and then probably. The, my question is uh, with regard to the reference to the Gita. You referred to Ichha as, uh, if I heard you correctly, as choice. There are a number of verses in the Gita where uh, Ichha is uh, more uh, referring to desire, like in chapter 7, verse 27, Krishna says, Ichha dvesh samutthen dvand mohin bharat sarbhutani sammoham sargeyanti param. That is because of desires and aversions that a lot of uh, delusion is taking place. Second comment is with regard to you said uh, teaching is over, now you can decide what you have to do. This is verse uh, 63 from chapter 18. But uh, as the Madam said, the Gita is quite enigmatic because the verse 61 of chapter 18 is in fact uh, the 675th verse. 15 verses still remain. And uh, one of the most powerful verses is the 66 verse where Krishna says, Sarv dharmani parityajya mamekam sharnam braj. So give up all duties and surrender unto me. So any views on that? Yeah, we'll take the other question also. Please be brief. Namaste. Uh, Rishi sir said a very good point that we Indians can't complain to the world if like the world becomes Hinduism and the, we, the Indians are not really actually embracing it then, but the world is embracing it. So that reminds me of Swami Vivekanand's thoughts on Sanskrit. So he said that there have been many great uh, legends who have been born here and then they sort of gave the education or the right path to the uh, Bharatiya people but that couldn't survive for more than a century. And the reason was, he said that, because we didn't have that culture. He, they couldn't build in that culture of our language, the Sanskrit language. So my question is that, for us to sort of bring back what we had, or to use our wisdom, can volunteerism, like uh, doing voluntary work can help there? Say, uh, the, we have constitutional limits. So our constitution, in, a, in some or the other sense, won't allow us to bring back that knowledge right away. So my question is that, will voluntarism help in some sense? I think Sunaina ma'am or someone else can go into Yeah, final question. I think he, since he raised his hand, and I just probably give him that. This is more a sort of a remark to what uh, Dr. Das has said, that India is not coming up with knowledge base which can be applied universally. Uh, you know, my uh, take on this is, uh, sir, that for example, this concept of soft power we are doing here, it is what like we are doing. We are adding Indian experiences about soft power to the knowledge of soft power. And that is itself is an achievement. A notion which is given by an American, of course, we are not trying to de-Americanize the entire concept. But yes, we are adding Indian experiences into it. 
because we are going to talk about the spirituality we are going to talk about uh, languages component of india is uh, india soft power the things which even joseph nai you know won't have anticipated that these could be the components of the elements of the soft power so these are the things i mean we need to notice i mean we may not be able to give a uh, you know a, a sort of a, 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 a universal kind of you know narratives but yes still we are adding our experiences into many notions thank you okay um just on this point i did say that itcha meant desire <coughs> in the context of the gita it meant choice in that context and as an educational theory that makes absolute sense sarvadhamma purutya jabras mama kamsha number ja as the principal verse of the sri vaishnava sampradaya so many it's a a pivotal verse in the gita without doubt but the fact that krishna gave arjuna a choice which is part of an intellectual tradition going back at least to the upanishads so there is an intellectual tradition to be discerned and that intellectual tradition needs to be in dialogue with other global intellectual traditions otherwise you're just you're just taking an intellectual tradition from somewhere else without critical thought and that's that's not helpful it's not helpful globally because you're not able to make your contribution um uh with regards well with regard to the point about um you know uh the, the bigger point that i'm discerning from this is it's not about india going and reviving something from the past that's gone forget about it it's about progressing and if you want to progress coming to your point sir um you know if you say introducing indian things well i'm an irish person having having a hindu experience i'm not indian I'm never going to be an Indian nationalist. I'm an Irish nationalist if I'm going to be one, but I've given up the idea of nationalism as well because of Hindu thought. So people around the globe are having these experiences and they're saluting to India. But it's not specifically Indian. It, they're universal concepts. The reason why they're attracted to India is that India has been very good at expressing universal concepts and being non-sectarian and being non-partisan. So that's that's a tremendous ability. And this idea of pluralism has been the reason why most people in the west have been attracted to India. That's been said about Voltaire's opinion, etc. Right going right back to Pythagoras. Every visitor has mentioned this, not only ahimsa, but the concept of pluralism, the fact that different religions live together. It's inconceivable for the western mind where things are either or. I I'm a I'm a Jew, you're a Christian, well you're wrong. in in india it's i'm a jew you're a christian what do you do and i look at your sadhana and then i judge that i know what kind of a person you are that's a very different concept I, educationally knowledge based philosophy culture how do you practice that now if if as was said earlier on in this conference if you slap the label indian on everything you're just going to freak everybody out everyone's just going to walk away because that's not pluralist that's not non sectarian that's not non partisan the beauty of it is it is those things so I, and this is inherent in an educational system and i think going forward and you know in tamil nadu now the educational system is going over to in english medium what's going to happen to tamil literature i'm meeting young kids who can't read tamil the tamil veda the tamil literature is voluminous tremendous culture it's going to be lost unconsciously unthoughtfully that's nearly a crime in terms of global heritage So India has a tremendous offering to make to the world but it really has to know what it's talking about it really has to understand its culture and what that offering is because it's really profound and it will change this course at the UN level it will change this course in executive education at every level of government if it's done with a sense of grace and dignity and humility and these are very much indian principles as i see it. could i could i ask add a comment Okay. Um the the issue of, of volunteerism. Um I think the most be, the best volunteerism you do is to volunteer your your truth, your understanding and everything you do. Right? Um yesterday when we had a uh, I approach it that way. And if we approach all of our lives with the idea that really what's tr what's truth is what's truth and that's what we're really going to focus on. Um, um Dr. Ramdas if okay. I might. Yeah. I think we can have that conversation over lunch. I think Sorry. we're over short and uh, uh, uh we'll just now request uh, the chair of the <coughs> session professor sunaina singh
to kindly felicitate our participants uh, speakers uh, to dr tatiana shamia but before that a big round of applause to all the panelists for a wonderful <laughs> presentation thank you professor ramdas lam to professor shonak uh, rashidas yeah you move to professor subhash kak Mr. Komik Apanthi, I'll now request uh, Vijay Lakshmi Ji, Director, India Foundation, to kindly felicitate the Chair of the Session, Professor Sunaina Singh. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be starting the next session on tourism immediately. Uh, there is an administrative announcement. All speakers are requested to give their boarding passes to the organizers uh, just outside where the reception is there uh, without fail. Thank you so much.